Yeah, it looks like we're live. Kind of a surprise thing on this evening, late at night. But, you know, sometimes when I sit here and I write and I think about things, I get uh, I get ideas. <laughs> sometimes I want to talk about them. What better medium than this this avenue of social media to discuss with the world those wonderful thoughts that that entertain a man's passing time. The moment you change your perception is the moment you rewrite the chemistry of your body. Dr. Rich, Dr. Bruce H. Lipton. I come across that looking over quotes by Manly P. Hall, the uh, celebrated spiritualist of the 1920s who wrote The Secret Teaching of All Ages. <laughs> it says each person must discover his own philosophy of life, and it is not fair or right to impose our codes upon others. It is also our responsibility, however, to share one with another, such as experiences as we may have common value. Those kinds of things are awfully deep. I think in a world that we're dealing with today, and so many of these teachings that we, that we are told we're supposed to value don't necessarily lead us to the prosperity that we would wish or hope for or for ourselves or for our children. <laughs> the uh, book that I'm currently working on is a little bit different. I went over the first chapter of it the other night. Tonight I'm going to discuss the second chapter, a little bit of it, and there will be some reading of it. So if you find yourself this evening comfortable and at rest, I hope I don't put you to sleep. But I think the ideas that I'm going to discuss in them are of sufficient weight and importance that it might capture your imagination and your attention. We'll start with the uh, reading from the uh, Prosetta where Gangleri asks the question, much indeed they had accomplished then, methinks, when heaven and earth were made, and the sun and the constellations of heaven were fixed, and division was made of days. Now whence come the men that people the world? And Har, meaning high, answered, when the sons of Bor were walking along the sea strand, they found two trees, and took up the trees and shaped men of them. The first gave them spirit and life, the second wit and feeling, the third, form, speech, hearing, and sight. They gave them clothing and names. The male was called Asker, and the female Embla, the Ash, and the Elm. And of them was mankind begotten, which received a dwelling place under Midgard. See, that one paragraph has a lot more information in it than you might expect. But one, but you've got to look at the other part of it in the Voluspa for a complete understanding of what we're going to try to outline here. And when I write these things, they usually just kind of come. I just start talking and start writing. And when I read them, I might change my mind. <laughs> Voluspa 17, then from the throng did three come forth from the home of the gods, the mighty and gracious, two without fate on the land they found, ask an embla empty of might. Some folks suggest that it was driftwood. I think they merely modified a, a living structure to compensate for the energy that's being shown upon it. That uh, is a premise that originates in the first chapter of this book, Blind. Soul they had not, since they had not, heat nor motion nor goodly hue. Soul gave Othen, since gave Honir, heat gave Lothar and goodly hue. When we talk about any origin mythology, the first temptation is to think that it was something that happened a long time ago. Something which is so far back in the distant past as to have no real effect on who and what we are today. The wording is ancient and perhaps full of riddles or references to concepts which we no longer value. You see, these two paragraphs from the Voluspa and the one from the Gilfanning are no exception. We today kind of enjoy them from the standpoint of faith and enjoy a certain sense of gratitude towards the mighty three from the throng. 
In a standalone setting, there seems to be no rhyme or reason as to why these three shapers and harnessers of energy might venture forth. Um, they step out to inspect their creation, so to speak. They meander along the barrier of sea and land, kind of taking a leisurely stroll. But we know that they are, in fact, still very much working in their efforts to manipulate energy into something their minds will make sense of, just in the same, in the same effort that we'll take a, a wild piece of land and turn it into a park for the community to enjoy. This is, they're trying to shape beauty as they understand it, that will handle the energies that bombard it every day, the sun, the wind, the sea, all of these things. This is something far beyond an uninspired mind's ability to comprehend. How would you go about exploring? This is going to take you out on a limb. I feel like Dr. Gene Squat here. How would you go about exploring an almost limitless abundance of shape and form, of light and dark, of action and stillness? For people today, we simply click on any number of websites to view the great things at the far reaches of our world and our imagination. The works of art from the greatest, most inspired minds are simply a click away. The most majestic works of the forces operating in this world are visible to anyone with a television. You can watch the BBC's production of Earth and see some of the most magnificent, awe-inspiring interactions of energy and life that you can imagine. <laughs> These awe-inspiring wonders of the natural world, majestic temples of the ancient world, Great savannas, jungles, and high mountain peaks covered with verdant forest, so vast we cannot easily grasp the amount of life contained within them. Trees so old and so tall we cannot imagine anything being so grand. For the inhabit inhabitants of the ancient world, they simply went on a journey. Grand adventures across the seas or on horseback, life and death were very real and experienced through all of the senses. How could one possibly experience it all? The origin of the myth of Christ has its roots in this question. But it was consolidated down to one man, so that everyone might focus their attention and their energy in one location. <laughs> And man began to look outward toward a central point instead of inward and his relation to the world. We became lost within our own minds, blind as it were, to what it was we were supposed to be experiencing. Not as beings experiencing the world through our senses, but something that but we were supposed to, something we were intended to be much more magnificent. See the harvesting of those ensuing doubts and the resources we would willingly expend to rid ourselves of these doubts has gone on for thousands of years. It's been a fleecing of the whole population of the world. Billions of people. This was, like I say, this was not the original intended purpose. For Odin and Vili and Ve, there was an understanding that the energy they had modified and harnessed would also change in the same way that they themselves had changed their environment. So gifts were given to beings that either made or blessed, that they either made or blessed, depending upon who you ask, so that they might have a conduit for unlimited viewing of every experience. It's an interesting idea. And it spread. Two became many millions in the abundance of energy and resources in life we now refer to as life. A bright and shining flow of self-motivating energy across the globe and around the world. Experiencing millions and millions of different emotions in a billion different situations every instant of every day. What would it mean to Ossetru if we begin to realize that those gifts given to us on far different shores along the ancient sea of time and space are ours to enjoy today? readily accessible as conduits to the divine. First, you kind of have to ask yourself, how would Odin deal with this diversion? <laughs> Perhaps he would sacrifice an eye to see a part of what we had been seeing so lost in our own thoughts. 
while we were content to enjoy the experience the world vicariously through the actions of others what might it look like in a story to warn us of becoming lost it would take from us the joy of being that conduit with the divine sharing experience and shaping with the divine energy the course of our own lives why it might look like the uninspired human intellect encouraging the blind man to rob the world of that most promising example of what a man might become. Every single time a baby enters this world, this new bundle of joy, life, and unbridled energy, they are in receipt of those wonderful gifts. It is our actions which hinder them. It is the teachings of blind men listening to the whispers of another, that blot out the sun in the lives of our most precious of gifts. Sometimes it originates from their own parents, <laughs> teaching them the ways of the world as they understand them, never once attempting to raise their heads to reach for the stars and something more. Are they not born with spirit and life, wit and feeling, form, speech, hearing and sight, so that they might navigate the world? How come we don't all end up in the same place then? How do so many become so lost in their own head when everything about them is designed so that they might be the perfect vehicle with which to roam this world and experience everything about it? I guess the point of fact is that we all do end up in the same place. That great north-south doorway of death herself. In ancient times, when the ship barrows were oriented to the north, and the south, it was reminiscent of the great yawning gap. The goddess who stood in the doorway was held, but her countenance was not split in half to the sides. It was separated from the front to the back. The front or south half was beautiful, warm, sun-facing goddess, welcoming all to the next stage of the journey. The back half of her was the dark, mysterious, decaying matter which produced more life. Energy was changed and modified in ways we can't comprehend. Energy changes. It is never destroyed. The complex processes of cellular utilization of energy stops to become food for another complex organism or to become heat in a home where another organism absorbs it. It does not go away. It simply changed into something so wildly different the original organism could not even comprehend what that might be. But humans have another little trick to help with that. Some call it intuition. Others call it second sight or even a bad feeling. Others refer to it as hope or love. The complex state of emotions as oriented around the sensory input of the situation we may be in is as complex a state of being as anything a baby might ever begin to understand. Faith and divine guidance have always been relied upon to help with that. But now, again, science has helped to shed a little light on it. We might begin by asking, where does inspiration come from? Well, part of it are those gifts we enjoy when we come into this world. Part of it is that our minds are tuned to experience, th experience things other than what our senses tell us is going on. See, in October of 1997, a team of researchers began to notice something unique about our brains. Namely, that certain cells remained in action despite the fact that there was seemingly no sensory input. It suggested a completely new theory concerning the processes of the brain. For most of scientific history, we have logically concluded that the brain and our understanding of the world we live in is largely deduced from a constant stream of sensory input. It has been a foregone conclusion that it is our senses which drive our thought process. What we see, feel, taste, touch, and smell are how we define the world around us. Never mind that we are all not going to interpret it in the same way. When you leave a room and someone else enters it, they may not even see the same color. They may have more or fewer cones in their eyes to determine the color of it. Does a tree make a sound if it falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it? No. If there's no receptor for those sound waves to pick it up, no, it's simply moving around. Does a fish know it's wet? 
It is so pronounced in such a large part of our lives today that there are entire branches of science dedicated to how the various forms of media may most effectively program our brains. It is a passive model of the brain. It is that they assume that they operate on what goes in all the time. The automatic processes of living are part of an older structure in our brain, the autopilot, so to speak, that does not answer where we receive inspiration from. But we've never had, truly had an inkling as to how this process really works. In October of 1997, a team of scientists produced an article which pointed out there is a certain set of neurons which rotate continuously in the brains of monkeys. So they began to study rats as well. The whiskers of a rat will help it feel its way around, sending sensory input back to the brain. But it also sends a signal in the exact same manner an FM signal is installed is utilized. Now, having built radio stations for most of my adult life, I have a little bit of understanding how that works. <laughs> these scientists noticed that these neurons would oscillate at a frequency of about 10 hertz. Whenever these whiskers would touch something, the frequency would change. A waveform of energy would travel through the brain and all of its pathways to provide a clear picture of just the, what the rat was dealing with. So it got a double whammy of what it was trying to deal with. What it, the sensory input from our five senses, and then another signal went to another part of the cells to activate, and it got another image of what that is. When you touch something, you can see in your mind what that is. This is the process that scientists identified. The research was followed up by scientists at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. These researchers actually illustrated the manner in which these brain cells lit up or tuned in to other parts of the brain, along with a set of frequencies from 35 hertz to 60 hertz. 35 hertz was the corresponding frequency for navigating a maze for memory. So they recognized everything. Everything's kind of on autopilot. The brain's not really doing anything. It doesn't have to think. It's just kind of moving through. Now, while a higher frequency, 60 hertz, was used when utilizing the landmarks. So now they're moving along. They're not getting the sensory input. They notice something way over there. Now they got it. So there's two different frequencies moving through the brain along with sensory input. And all of a sudden, this very simple passive model of of uh, sensory input and how the brain works is no longer quite that simple. Now there's something else at work here. The brain was actually tuning in to frequency to help it understand the world around it. Hmm. Our feelings, our emotional states or lack of them produce the same kind of results in the brain with no sensory input. A different frequency. What about those great spiritual aha moments we've all experienced? Where does that frequency originate? Some would tell you, and I will too, that there is a spiritual connection which activates a set of neurons in our brains exactly the same way. And do we perceive our world as a rosy, happy-go-lucky place, or we begin to see the negative in every house? And the choice is absolutely 100% yours to make. In telling you all of that, my hope is that you might begin to see that we are still in receipt of those old original gifts right here and right now. To avail ourselves of what that means, we find a clue in science to suggest that our brains may well still be specifically designed to interpret wavelengths of energy. What if we are capable of tuning in to a spiritual frequency as well? It would seem that our brains are more than capable of doing so. Our ancestors placed much stock in the validity of dreams. Where else would these fantastic thoughts originate? Where exactly do your spiritual thoughts originate? What do they sound like? Have you ever thought about them before? What were the triggers which tied two things together so that you can obtain a clearer picture? Or a much more tainted one? The possibility in all of, the, all of this is that we might have access to a much larger inventory of tools to handle life than we previously imagined. Faith is a state of mind. If we tune ours to the proper coordinates, who knows where we might end up? 
I suspect it will be much further along the path than we currently are. Is it really possible that all we need to do is pay attention to our own intuition? Is it most likely just as simple as that? Enough people have done this so that this faith of also true has reemerged on this planet at a time when it is sorely needed. The confusing passive model of a passive thought process for our minds, our brains, and a focus on something outside of ourselves as the origination of what might be most great of, about us has been a, a magnificent failure. It has been a bamboozling of the entirety of mankind. And now, on this ancient faith, <laughs> gives us some insight when we just stop to pay attention, when we clear away those old painful memories and thought processes that we were taught as when we were young in school and in church by our parents, and we begin to clear our minds, new ideas form in our minds seemingly of their own volition. Hundreds of people write books about also true and this opening of the mind's eye and what was this eye that Odin sacrificed so that he could see. There's something very unique happening in all of this that, that I think if we do it right, if we clear away those ideas that poison our thought process, that we open our mind's eye, that we open our hearts to ideas of a spiritual nature from our ancient past, that we will get these answers. Meditative practices are essential in this. I think in the world of today, a lot of this stems from the fact that I, I watched that video of those Muslim men killing those tourists, those tourist girls. It was probably one of the most terrifying, one of it's just an absolutely horrible thing to view. And I saw a group of men completely shut off from any kind of idea of inspiration that might even remotely resemble something divine or something to make the world better. <laughs> that is the state of affairs in which people began to back away became okay being a part of the fringe element of society and began to wonder if there was a way where we might develop a true nautical standard and an august thought process so that we might move this forward so our children never have to face a horror or a fear or a terrifying pain that men might inflict upon each other. Now don't get me wrong. When it comes to defending something like that, you give it everything you got. But in those quiet times, in those times when we're by ourselves, we no longer have to feel lonely. We can be alone and we can understand that there is somewhere from whence these great and profound spiritual thoughts appear in our minds unbidden and guide us to a point in life we might be able to kick back, put up our feet, enjoy the abundance of the world around us, and realize that even though you are on the fringe of society with your spirituality, that right here, right now, between grown people that decide to share these ideas, it's going to be okay. What greater hope could you ever wish to bestow upon humanity as your legacy? That's a part of mine. Thank you.